Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 496 of the podcast. Oh, so close to 500. (laughs) And it is Friday the 3rd of July 2020 as I record this. So today I'm talking to Marion Roach-Smith about writing memoir, although much of what we talk about is valid for any genre. So I think you'll find this interesting whatever you write, such as writing something universal as illustrated by a deeply personal tale. That is true whether you're writing fiction, uh, even non-fiction. It really is uh, getting deeply personal if it's our character's personal personal side or our own. So I've mentioned before that I've definitely got a travel memoir in me. (laughs) And Marion says memoir is the single greatest portal to self-discovery, which is tantalising in itself. And uh, I will get there one of these days. (laughs) As ever, there is so much to write and so little time. Uh, We also talk about building a business around a book, and there are many business models. Sometimes I feel that the indie author community gets too obsessed with the write fast, write fiction series, put books in KU and use advertising. (laughs) That is not actually the model of most writers, certainly not non-fiction writers, um, many of whom have businesses around the book. And Marion talks about her business model of writing, teaching and now podcasting at her QWERTY podcast. And she has such a lovely voice. So definitely check out her show where she ranges across lots of fascinating topics. And I was on there a few months back talking about wide ranging creativity and publishing wide and not getting in a box. (laughs) So that is coming up. So I'm going to get straight into my personal update this week. I've been, I was really thinking about what to share in this segment. And I've had one of those frustrating technical weeks. I've been re-recording my tutorials around building an author website and setting it up with a theme and setting up and building an email list. So if you have a website for as long as I have had one, (laughs) uh, so what are we coming up to 12 years, the creative pen, inevitably things start falling, we all start falling off and, you know, bits and bobs go wrong here and there. And there's been just a few little niggly things this week. I'm like, oh, and you know, you need to do this, that and the other. And uh, that's been painful. But I, I also doing these tutorials, it's so interesting because of course, doing a good, well edited tutorial takes a lot longer. So to do sort of a 30 minute tutorial might take all day. (laughs) So I feel and then uh, there was one I was all set up one day and I started recording and then someone started drilling outside that just always happens. And so I feel like there's been a lot of frustration. And then I sort of took a step back and said, why am I getting so angry and frustrated? Uh, Because as you know, I'm not a particularly angry person. And I'm uh, I was like, why why am I so tired all the time? So what I was going to talk about is that when you if you actually look if you if you google at the moment why am i so tired all the time it's probably not because you have some kind of disease or even covid or whatever they're calling it pandemic fatigue emotional exhaustion and the uh, things that you might be feeling fatigue irritability impatience anger and um you know i feel obviously i'm not a care worker i'm not a health worker and i on the one hand, I'm like, I we have to be really grateful. If, and I'm sure some of you listening are in that situation, in which case, thank you for your work. Uh, but it's weird. I feel like I shouldn't be so tired. I don't have a stressful job. But when I was reading about uh, this kind of feeling, most of these articles say that, you know, we are moving into this new phase now, but it, we have been living at a level of anxiety and Uh, sort of existential stress for months now. And this really does make us feel tired. It's a very tiring situation to be in. So I just wanted to mention it because maybe you're feeling this way too. It's like everything's turning into a huge deal. And in those early weeks and months, we were dealing with almost grief. I mean, obviously, many people have lost family members and friends and there is the loss on and the grief of actual people and then there's the grief of health Um, but then there's also 
the loss of the way life was. And even though in a way it feels like some of it's coming back, in another way it's not. It actually feels um, dangerous again. As things start to open up in the UK, there are these sort of two messages, the sort of get out there and spend money to save the economy. And then the other one is stay home, (laughs) stay safe, all of the above. And I'm not going to comment on your situation. Obviously, everyone is in their different situation, living in different places where there are different levels of the pandemic. But it's sort of the edge of immediate panic has dropped off but there is this sort of low level hum of anxiety and that's what's so tiring there's also this relentless news cycle that continues and if you make them what they call it doom scrolling <laughs> so i fell into it the other other day when i i i had i was looking at the basic health news around the world and then of course some of the stuff uh, racial stuff happening and then I fell into the arctic and global warming and then you went you realize that you've just gone down this doom hole (laughs) so I wanted to share it with you because I I'm not usually like that and then suddenly I find myself in it and that's why I'm so tired and to be fair though I have been working really hard and it's weird because I've always been a workaholic. I like to work. It's something I enjoy doing. But equally, what normally happens is I have these trips and I never work when I'm traveling. I'm always, I say I never work. I mean, I'm, I'm working in a way. My brain is working, but I'm not at the computer hunched over. And I'm at the moment, I'm doing two sessions a week with my trainer on Uh, zoom because the my shoulder pain and back pain and everything is like because I'm at my computer all the time so I wanted to just mention that and hope that you guys uh, I wanted to make you feel slightly more normal if you're going through that and what can we do because we need actionable points obviously one ration social media and news I'm telling myself this like seriously big time stop doom scrolling (laughs) And if you catch yourself, go, ooh, doom doom scrolling, that's what I'm doing, stop it. Also being kind to ourselves and accept that everyone is under a lot of stress. Now, there are some very right and proper changes going on in the world at the moment but there are also there's a lot of things people are shouting about that can really get in the way of being able to live um, in a sort of calm fashion (laughs) so I think being kind to ourselves and also accept that other people are under a lot of stress and sometimes if someone lashes out at you it might not be personal and um, the world is not even slightly normal right now so yeah let's be kind and forgiving also look at what else you can cut out that is stressful and say no more so uh, I have I said yes to so many online things earlier on in you know the covid pandemic thing that I've had too much and now I I really need to stop so I'm uh, putting a moratorium on doing things for a while and having to say no or move it into the autumn Because the other thing is, I mean, there really isn't an end in sight right now. If you look at how things are progressing, we're going to have to find the next level of the new normal so that we can carry on and not just get really sick. (laughs) Also, indulge in escapist media. I have been going to bed at sort of nine o'clock. It's very light in the evenings here. I've been going to bed at nine and reading until the darkness at, you know, half past 10 or something and um, I've been reading a lot of escapist fun fiction and then also some Netflix and in fact last night was hilarious because um, there was a new series that arrived called Warrior Nun (laughs) it just makes me laugh to even say the title I said to Jonathan wow they really targeted me with this the Warrior Nun series uh, sort of you know it's a a young adult uh, supernatural with nuns so I'm pretty happy with that Uh, So, yes, I can recommend Escapist uh, Warrior Nun on Netflix. (laughs) Oh, what else? Yes, so I also, to take this into the realm of business, I also think the change in the social media. So, for example, saying Russian social media, I've seen a lot of people go, I'm cutting down on Facebook, Twitter, all my Instagram, all these different things. I'm filtering more. And I'm only listening to certain people. And this kind of social media exhaustion and filtering is a very interesting situation. 
I think that's going to have further ramifications into uh, the book marketing space. In fact, this week, the bookseller put out a tweet that said, uh, fill in our social media survey. And so I clicked on it and read through the questions. And I felt that the questions were really loaded towards uh, feeling that social media was not particularly beneficial for authors and book marketing. And what was hilarious is they took it down really fast. Now, I don't know what the results were, whether I'll, if I hear about them, I'll let you know. But it was interesting because I actually feel that this is what's going on right now is there's a bit of a backlash against social media. What is also interesting is that Business Insider and various other news outlets have just reported that Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg, Google's Sundar Pichai, Apple's Tim Cook and Amazon's Jeff Bezos will all testify before the US Congress in an antitrust hearing in late July 2020. So what does that mean? Well, it's very interesting because there is, I've been talking about this for a while, I think over a year ago, I, um, uh, Elizabeth Warren and various uh, people on either side of the US political spectrum have talked about the potential breakup of these big companies, the fact that they dominate, have so much power. And um, the breakup of any of those companies would have a potentially huge impact. And even if they're not broken up, uh, further regulation would also impact us. Even things like the I can't remember the particular article, but this um, article that says that the platforms are not publishers, so they're not responsible for what's on their platform, that allows a lot of freedom, both good and bad. And we're seeing both good and bad kind of explode right now. Uh, you know what I mean. I mean, it's there's a lot of issues. So people are voting with their feet. A lot of people, as I said, are filtering. Are, I mean, there's big companies leaving Facebook in terms of advertising. So what I, all I wanted to say with this is, I think whatever happens in November in the US, it's likely that things will change. Both sides are interested in these companies and their impact on the world, really. It's certainly not just the US that these companies have uh, great power over. So if you rely on any of these companies too much for your author business, what can you do to make sure you can still sell, still um Uh, reach your readers if they are regulated or split up or change the rules because that's another possibility and uh, I usually find that the answer is grow and nurture your email list (laughs) so you can talk to people Uh, yeah so of course you can sign up for my email list at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint and uh, yeah so that's interesting In useful stuff, I wanted to give a shout out to Publisher Rocket this week. You can now unleash the categories, as uh, Dave Chesson says. New functionality in the latest version. This is, uh, and of course, if you if you have Publisher Rocket, uh, and I have a uh, affiliate link, thecreativepen.com forward slash rocket. Uh, it will be available to everyone who already has it. You just need to like restart it. Very useful for finding categories. Now, this is a great update because w- we've had trouble with categories for a while now and Amazon's made it really hard to discover what categories you're in but also how to see what categories other books are in or even what are, what is available and remember you can add 10 categories if you email Amazon Author Central or KDP Help and uh, this week Dave Chesson from Publisher Rocket was on the Writers Inc podcast talking about this change and also that he has some tools coming for the other platforms which is good news for wide authors. Also Dave thinks that exciting times are coming for Nook which certainly made my ears perk up since I also mentioned a week or couple of weeks ago that James Daunt the Uh, managing director for both Barnes & Noble and Waterstones here in the UK, also mentioned they are refocusing on digital because it's done so well in the pandemic times. So uh, definitely go check out the interview with Dave Chesson on Writers Inc. and go check out Publisher Rocket, which is super useful for categories and keywords and research. And also useful this week, I'm doing a webinar with Nick Stevenson and we are doing a step-by-step action plan to take your book sales to $1,000 a month or if you're already at that, then how to take it further. We're going back to basics and I almost feel like because it's 
the second half of 2020, we want to take control of what we can. And uh, let's face it, we can't control most of what's going on in the wider world, but we can control ourselves and our own book marketing. So we'll be talking about how to get traffic, convert that traffic into sales and email subscribers, and then how to use your email list to get reviews and sell your backlist and also how to scale. Now, Nick truly is the best email copywriter I know, and I am actually refocusing on building my fiction email list at the moment. It's very good to revisit the basics. And uh, that's definitely, I all, I think sometimes we just overcomplicate things. And the pandemic has helped a lot of us, I think, to get back to the basics, what we want to achieve, what we care about, you know, how we want to spend our time. And um, yeah, so come along and join Nick and me. Thursday, 16th of July, 8 p.m. UK, 3 p.m. US Eastern. And if you register, you'll get the replay. So join us, thecreativepen.com forward slash 16 July, 16 July. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Heaven Boland said, uh, thanks to Natalie Sisson. I loved the episode. It definitely helped me a lot. Uh, Thanks to Stephen Moore, who sent a lovely picture from a moody beach. Fantastic morning walk along Cannon Beach, Oregon, from the Goonies, listening to the fantastic The Creative Pen interview with J.D. Barker. Fantastic. Um, Laura Bradbury says, this was such a great episode. So useful as I'm self-editing right now. That was um, about the Chris Spizak episode. Even Pepper listened while trying to figure out her mask. Sent a very cute picture of Pepper the dog. Thank you, Laura. Also, thanks to Ken. Uh, Ken sent me an email, said, thanks for the podcast about dictation. Scott Baker's in particular. And this is great because I interviewed Scott probably four years ago, three years ago, four years ago. And Ken said, after finding myself in something of a rut of late, frustrated at my slow pace, I decided to try dictation, turned to the show, listened to the podcast, followed the recommendations. Amazing. I was optimistic going into it, but have been blown away. I have doubled the output of first draft material. I think the writing itself is stronger, more natural, better paced, more suited to the inevitable, the eventual audiobook. Uh, so I, I wanted to share that email because uh, I also I want to get back to dictation with Tree of Life and intending to get back into that in the next couple of weeks. And uh, it's good. It's always good to be reminded of all the shows. This is part of the issue of coming up to episode 500. I have forgotten most of the people I've talked to over the years. And, and I, I do have a um, Google search bar now on the Creative Pen. If you just go to the homepage or the um, start here button, you will find a, a Google search for the website. And I sometimes go there because I completely forget who I talk to. But yes, dictation, lots of info on that. Also, Thompson Street Farm said, just just finished your business planning course. Here is a screenshot of the Sullivan Empire map. Holy moly, this is a lot. I obviously need to cut back on a few things or hire help. (laughs) And uh, Thompson Street Farm sent a really huge mind map of what their business looks like. And uh, that is in reference to my author business plan mini course, which has lots of info. If you want to take control of the second half of the year, go to thecreativepen.com forward slash learn if you're interested and finally mk williams says after listening after years of listening to the creative pen and slowly incorporating advice into my author plan i signed up for payhip and had my first direct book sales hit yesterday great to hear mk and mk is from the choose fi podcast uh, which uh, i was on a few months ago at the beginning of the pandemic <laughs> <laughs> so uh, great to hear. Okay, so today's show is sponsored by Draft to Digital and I'll play a word from the lovely Kevin Tomlinson in a minute. And actually, last night, uh, as I record this, I hung out with Kevin on the Draft to Digital live show, which is on YouTube and Facebook under Draft to Digital. And it will be on their podcast feed at some point. Now, Kevin, it's, it's a really funny video because Kevin's sitting in a sun-drenched RV park in Florida. Um, I think it was Florida or Texas or somewhere like that, somewhere that looked really tropical. (laughs) And I was at home in the dark. And that's basic. That was just really funny. We had a good chat. I'm friends with Kevin. We've known each other a long time. And we just had some good banter about some of the changes that the pandemic have brought in, um, uh, in terms of online conferences, online marketing. We also answered some questions about wide publishing. So go check that out on the D2D Live. 
And uh, this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thank you so much for supporting the show. I know it's a difficult time for many people and uh, I really appreciate uh just a few dollars a month is it just means an awful lot at the moment so uh, thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show some of you for many years now you guys are fantastic and thanks to new patrons jessica cochran timothy lyon tracy higley timbo which is a great kylie zeal maria franklin lena and john say I really appreciate your support on Patreon. And remember, if you support the show with just a couple of dollars a month, you get the extra Q&A audio. You also get percentages off my uh, courses. So if you're thinking of doing any courses, then uh, if, even if you join the Patreon for a month, you'll still get um, 10% off my courses. So that's, that's even worth it. <laughs> you'll uh, also get the entire backlist of Q&A audio. You can support the show at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a word from Kevin from Drafter Digital, and then we'll get into the interview. Hey, this is Kevin Tomlinson from Drafter Digital. Discoverability is the key to author marketing success, but it's one of the toughest things about the business. How do readers find your work? draft digital can help with that thanks to reading lists. Built around our universal book links, D2D reading lists let you create a bookshelf with customizable carousels crammed full of your books. They can be organized by series, release dates, themes, heck, even the color of your covers if you want. It's all up to you. You can also feature books by other authors, and just to make a little extra cash, you can include your affiliate links to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple, Kobo, heck, even certain competitors who want to smash your words in a meat grinder. That's one of my favorites. Kevin Smash! You'll find reading lists and a whole bunch of other great promotion and marketing tools at books2read.com. Powered by Drafted Digital. Go to books, the number two, read.com and discover discoverability for yourself. Marion Roach Smith is an author, memoir coach, and teacher of memoir writing. She has online courses on writing memoir, and her books include The Memoir Project, a thoroughly non standardized text for writing and life. Welcome, Marion. Lovely to be back. It's so great to hear your voice. Oh, indeed. And you, you were on the show years ago and we thought it was about time that you came back on. And But for those of you who might have missed the original episode, uh, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. I've been a full-time writer since 1983 when I left the New York Times. I had been there for six years. And during that time, I wrote a magazine piece for the New York Times magazine, arguably the Certainly, some people think the most powerful magazine in the world. I had no idea how powerful till I wrote a piece for them at 26. That was really the first first person account of Alzheimer's disease. Strangely enough, there was a time when none of us had heard of it. And it launched my career, got me a book offer. And I left the New York Times and have since published four books and lots of magazine pieces and done lots of radio work and op-eds, and then started this thing called The Memoir Project a bunch of years ago that's now online, which is a writing lab where I teach a lot of courses. And there's a book that goes with it called The Memoir Project. So I kind of built a business around a book that I published, which is a model that I find kind of interesting and I hope other people will find as well. I wrote published this book in 2011, and then I built this online teaching business about memoir. Which is fantastic. And the, we're going to come back to the business model, I think, in a bit, because it's uh, mm-hmm. really great that you mentioned that. But let's let's talk about memoir. So how do you define memoir and how is it different from autobiography? So it's a really important distinction. If you're someone who's really famous in this world, who's the most famous person we can think of? Uh, we think of you, whoever your favorite rock star is or whoever your favorite politician is. And we know where they end up, right? We know what they do in the large sense. We're going to be happy to read their autobiography because we want to know about the little decisions. We want to know about the college that they went to and who they dated. You know, if it's a rock star, we want to know who they had an affair with and where they went and where they go on summer vacation. That's autobiography. One big book that covers everything about your life. For the rest of us, there's memoir which is written from one of your many areas of expertise, and you have a dozen or so areas of expertise, and is written in which you show us what you know after something you've been through. So 
you have a dozen area of ex- areas of expertise. Maybe you've had dogs all your life. Maybe you did caregiving for an, a sick relative. Maybe you've been in a long marriage. Those are three different areas of expertise. And for a memoir, you can have a writing life if you write from one area of your expertise at a time and don't tend toward autobiography. So I keep it really simple. Memoir is about one aspect of your life and autobiography is that big book that covers all aspects of your life and is best left to the famous. And it best left until you're, you're dead. <laughs> well, I guess it's not autobiography now, but a lot of people sort of do that later on, don't they? Or like you say, uh, I don't know, Bill Clinton from nowhere right. to president and right. on after that type of thing. Right. Although only you could write a book that is written by someone who's dead. So I'm going to leave that to your <laughs> fabulous genre. And I think you should make note of that. The, the memoir from the dead would be a fabulous title. And uh, I give that to you as a gift today. <laughs> ah, thank you so much. And anyone else listening? I mean, no, you're completely right. But it's interesting because you said they're areas of expertise, which it's a, it's a great phrase, but it's interesting because I think of area of expertise, like I have books for authors, as do you, obviously, but I would never think of writing a memoir about my time self-publishing so Mm -hmm. I wondered like what are some of the ways to shape a memoir like you mentioned uh, dogs for example there's theme and time and place and and, but I think area of expertise could be so many things so what are what are the ways that make it easier to grasp onto the things that people might care about so you're going to be willing to argue something. And I don't mean argue like get into a tussle. I mean, propose something to us, something that you know, after something you've been through. And you could, in fact, write memoir from the calamitous, hilarious, and ultimately successful place of self-publishing. Because (laughs) I know from mass market publishing, having published a book when I was 27 with one of the largest publishing houses in the world, I had a wild time in the true sense of the word out there on the road when they used to send authors out for two weeks. And I could certainly have written a hilarious memoir from being on the road promoting a book. So you could, with enough of a sense of humor and real skill, kind of combine a how-to and a fun memoir that's written from that area of expertise. But what I really mean is that you're arguing something. This is how you start memoir. You answer the question, what is this about? And you think about the universal, not about your plot line. That's what you've been saying to people for years when they ask you, what's your book about? You've been telling them your plot line and notice how their eyes glaze over immediately. Instead, if you say, it's about the complicated journey of mercy. Oh, you have my attention. And then you say, as illustrated by my forgiving the man who abused me when I was a child to be told in a book. Look at the way that draws us in. It's about something universal, as illustrated by a deeply personal tale, to be told in a certain length. And that universal, that first part of that sentence, I call it the X factor, is what you're willing to argue, that mercy is a complicated process. So all you're doing when you write memoir is drilling in to the various things you have some expertise in. It might be mercy. It might be The fact that gardening brings peace to your soul. It might be that dogs do things for people that people cannot do for themselves. So I always ask people to consider each memoir from that area of expertise. But that area of expertise is something you would be willing to share with us based on what you know, what you're willing to argue. So it's always, always, always argument driven and not plot driven. Everyone makes the mistake of thinking memoir is a plot driven genre. It's an argument-driven genre. It's about experience. Mm. Actually, and that comes back to the difference to autobiography, right? Because autobiography is this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And it is a a plot uh, in order. Whereas a memoir doesn't have to be in order, does it? It it can be lots of, it doesn't have to be this week, this happened, the following week, this happened. Exactly. Quite the opposite. Because think of some of the things that happened to you that you did not understand until you were X years old. That doesn't make a lot of sense if you're writing about gardening, but it does make a lot of sense if I get back to one of the examples I used a moment ago about an abusive experience. Children don't have language for what's happening, but in therapy or with age or watching movies or reading good literature or whatever gives us that language to understand what happened to us also gives us the understanding to change the end of that story. 
to get control of it. I'm not saying you you deny it. I'm saying you get control. And once, as you know, you get control of a story, you can drive it where it needs to go. You can figure out where it ends. So yes, I think biography is absolute. Autobiography is absolutely plot driven, and memoir can be told out of order, can be told in flashbacks, can be told in what in lists if that's your thing. It's a wonderful genre, but it's wonderfully misunderstood by people and confused with autobiography all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you've mentioned, you know, deeply personal things and something you know based on something you've been through, which I, I really like that phrase. Now, we all need therapy at some point in our lives. but Yes, I, yes, yes. Yeah, I feel that <laughs> some people consider writing a memoir to be therapy. So what, where are the lines between therapy and memoir? You know, what can potentially go wrong if you get that line wrong? <laughs> oh, yeah, the great smudge, as I call it. <laughs> so one of my favorite words, smudge, because it sounds like what it is, doesn't it? It's like smudge. Yeah, <laughs> when you smudge that, you get into trouble. So writing memoir is the single greatest portal to self-discovery. That's true. Because think of it, you say things like, you know, I really love my husband. He's like, so great. He's great. I mean, like, he's great. Now, what did, <laughs> what did anyone learn? Nothing. But if you tell me a story about your husband taking the time, 10 minutes or so, to give you some really bad news by giving it to you in tiny morsels so you could metabolize it, and the kindness that he showed when he did that, we'll understand why you're with that person for the rest of your life. So in other words, once you write that story, you start to feel something much more deep and abiding about that person about whom you're writing. So that's therapeutic. It absolutely is therapeutic, but it's not therapy. In other words, I always advise people if they're dealing with a tough subject to be in professional hands, psychiatric or psychological hands or social work hands as well. But we don't want to just blah, blah, blah all over the page and tell me how you got better. Nobody wants to read the sentence, I'm sober, I found God, I'm good, right? That's not what we're reading for. We're reading to fill our own sense of wonder or mercy or forgiveness. And so if you just do therapy on the page, we're not going to experience the transcendence that memoir is famous for. If the memoir writing is therapeutic for you, how great. In fact, I think it always is because I think a deeper understanding of everything, even the relationship you have with your garden, is a good thing. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I I've, I keep walking up to the idea of a memoir and then walking away again. <laughs> <laughs> and I have talked to people who say, you know, I spent 30 years writing this memoir, as in they mm -hmm. did exactly that, approached it and then walked away again and maybe wrote something and then walked away again. I mean, obviously, how you teach it as well and how you said at the beginning, you can have different memoirs. But do, mm -hmm. do some people is, you know, can memoir be the, uh, the one book that you write at some point that deals with that big thing in your life that you haven't really talked about or you know I, I feel like it can be a really big genre but the way that you talk about it it could also be like you say some stories about your garden it can be both it could be a huge piece of work and then you could write five or six other book length memoirs that take on smaller topics my education in this came by reading the great writer Caroline Knapp who wrote my favorite book of memoir because its structure is perfect it's called drinking a love story. Also my favorite title of any memoir and the only memoir I put in anyone's hands when they ask for a suggestion of a book to read. You may not like the story. You may not be interested in women and alcoholism. You may not like her voice. You may not like her, uh, whatever. But what she taught me when I read that book was she wrote from one area of her expertise at a time. And then she wrote a book about the relationship she had with her dogs. And I thought, huh? What? two memoir she's only she's under 50 what I don't get it and then I got it the penny dropped and when she died tragically young her best friend wrote a memoir about their friendship and so I think you can wait and write one book about something that has been really profound in your life your relationship with God your f sense of forgiveness of the historic violence that hurtled through five or six known generations in your family that you refuse to engage in, 
Or you can write one big one and five little ones or five small ones. It's giving permission to people to have a writing life and not just live in this one big book that begins with their great, 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 great grandfather and ends with what they had for lunch today (laughs) that I'm really committed to. I'm really committed to giving people a writing life and not one book that they never finish and no one ever reads. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of feel the same about fiction. I think that sometimes people think they should write just the one great American novel or the one great, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning novel. And that that's actually a really hard aim. <laughs> Whereas if you say, well, I'm just going to write a story and then, th- then I'll write another story and then another one, you know, you're far more likely to get somewhere if, if you do that. So I quite like what you're saying. But I do want to ask about writing about other people, because like you've mentioned, there are some, you know, let's say family, using family abuse. I mean, it's a regular topic, but it's awful. It's an awful topic. But mm-hmm. we also know that people have different views on what ha- happened in a right. family history. And if people are alive or people who love those people who are alive, and there are a lot of potential legal issues, but also emotional issues if you offend or upset other people in your family who you love. So wh- what are your tips for writing about other people? Sure. First, write it. Let's see what you have before you talk yourself out of writing it. So this is a good rule to follow because there are so many reasons not to write. You've been told it has no value. You've been told it won't make you money. You've been told that you're not good. You've been told you're not good enough. We've all got that whole stew in our heads. So let's just start by not adding to that and saying, okay, I'm going to write it down and I'm going to use the real names. And here's the key. I'm not going to show it to anyone and I'm not going to talk to my family about what I'm writing. I'm going to find someone who is invested in my success as a writer. That's going to be a coach, or maybe you have a friend who's an editor. Maybe you have a friend who's a great reader. My friends are mostly writers. I'm sure most of your friends at this stage in your career are mostly writers. So there are people with whom I can trade that time. And so you've got to find somebody who's invested in your success and who's going to read well, because we want to leave the names in in this first draft. We want to see what we really do have. 99% of the time, people who set off to write a book of revenge stop doing so within the first 25 pages because there's not much to say. Mm -hmm. If all your intent is to just, I'm going to tell myself, I'm going to get set that record straight. It it, will wear you out or you'll realize what a fruitless effort it is. So that will straighten itself out. And then suddenly you might, like many of the people that I've dealt with, and I've now worked on hundreds of, with hundreds of writers who have written from me too, you might discover that what got taken from you as a child was not just the physical sense of safety, but your voice. As you got told, don't tell, or you got told you like it, or you got told, I'll kill you if you tell someone, and that your book ends up being about voice. In other words, you may find out, I'm not saying you make it a different, a better story, a more tolerable story, but if you write it, you may find that you're arguing something that is far more universal, instructive, illustrative, therapeutic, positive in for you, I'm not saying it has to be a happy ending, than a book that that recounts the abuse, right? So we may be getting into very, very much lesser territory in terms of the legal aspects. However, there will be legal aspects, there will be emotional aspects, there will be family aspects. Memoir has consequences. But we don't know what they are until you write that first draft. So first, I always tell people to write it, not share it with anybody, and get someone who's invested in your success. Yes, you may offend or upset people. The strangest thing is that you will almost always offend or upset someone because memoir is the hardest genre there is to edit. In other words, you're going to leave out second grade teachers, dogs you've had, cousins. You might leave out siblings. You may never mention your parents in this book. (laughs) So you are going to offend somebody anyway. (laughs) And that's just true because you're not writing a big book with everybody in it. So let's first start with the ethic of getting it down and seeing what you learn. And here's the therapeutic part, what you learn along the way that in fact, it's really a book about voice. And we don't actually really need his name because it's not about that. And I'm not saying you hide the details, but I'm saying they change in value. So let's write a first draft first and see what we've got. I I love that advice. Uh, And again, I think that's actually the same for any book 
that you end up writing because we're all like oh I've got this idea and it's like yeah sure ideas are nothing right execution is everything and well this memoir I've got an idea for you know I I I really uh, and then I I, when I walk towards it I'm like yeah there's nothing there yet it's not it's not there but it's like you said about people thinking that a book might be about them they are the hero of their story so they think your story must be about them but of course it's not necessarily because you're the hero of your story (laughs) so (laughs) I love that it's brilliant (laughs) yeah it's it's fascinating to see someone look up from their life I've worked now with thousands of writers literally and and I've worked with so many during the the real crescendo of Me Too in the very beginning of it, here in the United States at least, before we had these hearings uh, for the Supreme Court Justice, Justice Kavanaugh, which literally I have not gotten an email since the Kavanaugh hearings in two years. Well, I've gotten a few, but in the run up to that, I was getting them after the first major big high profile arrest in America, my email box was just flooded with people saying, I have never told my story. I've waited 38 years to tell it. I want to tell it now. And then when the Kavanaugh hearings, which seated a Supreme Court justice who's been accused of sexual abuse, which seated him as a Supreme Court justice, my my email box went silent again. Now that's a very bad sign, Mm. right? But what I found fascinating was watching someone look up from the story during it, two months in, five months in, and having them say to me, I think this is a book about finding my voice. Oh, well, now we're talking. Mm. Right? Because voice is, as you know, as a writer, everything. Mm. Yeah. And when once you start writing, as you say, you might find the thing that it's really about. And um, that at some point, I will set aside time to do the memoir I want to write but as I said it might be a while <laughs> in the meantime well, now you've told me so I am going to be sending you little emails a little reminder every now and then <laughs> but let's um let's talk about something that you know when I think about this specific detail is always important in in any genre actually but with memoir as you say, I mean, the it has to be based on our life. But I feel like the line between memory and truth, like what do I what I remember and what is true could be completely wrong. And also, if I remember a conversation, some kind of emotional resonance of a conversation, but I can't remember the de- the actual words said or the actual place where that was said, how do I strike the balance in a memoir between memory and what really happened and then just adding stuff based on it being 1986 or something. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you've covered about six really good topics in that question. And they're they're easy to, to really negotiate because you're talking about detail. Detail is currency. And when I read your story, I enter your country, just like I do when I travel. And I cash out my currency for yours. And you get to put coins in my pocket. But before I leave your country, your story, I want to have spent every single one. And what I'm spending them on is learning your argument that peace can be found in my own backyard. I'm not an eat, pray, love person. I'm a garden at home person and find peace. So I could write a book from my own backyard that shows you that I can have a transcendent experience back there. So I'm going to give you the details of my transcendent experience back there. Beads, On an abacus is the way you want to think of of your details if you don't want to think about them as currency. You want to put something to use. This detail plus this detail plus this detail illustrates this argument. It adds up to this argument. So details are very important. You have to curate carefully from your own life to only show me or give me the coins or whatever metaphor you want to use. Show me the details that add up to your argument. And so you have to remember that your details are not the same as your sister's details. Christmas 2004 was the worst Christmas of her life. It was the best one of yours, right? What, what, she says, what? Do you remember that Uncle Willie got drunk and fell down in the pack of Sandra? And you say, oh, I must have missed that. I was so busy making out with my boyfriend on the couch. (laughs) (laughs) Very different Christmases, right? And so that's so important. What details are you going to give me to navigate? You're going to give me yours. And it is wildly subjective. 
I only care about your point of view. And if you don't remember those details, you can ask your sister about Christmas 2004, but she's going to tell you her version. You're going to have yours. And so I always say to people, do your research. So what does research look like for memoir? It means asking your sister, but expecting that the experience was different. Don't let that stop you, though. It can mean looking in your high school yearbook. It can looking looking in your college yearbook. You can do research on your, your house. You can do research on your neighborhood. You can do research on your neighborhood association. You can go back to your primary school. There is ways to reassemble the names and dates and places because everyone thinks memoir doesn't require research. It requires enormous amounts of research. You want to check your facts. Why? Because you want to get it in context. So that's a long answer to details, which are very specific, curated, chosen coins that the writer puts in the reader's pocket that reflect the writer's point of view but that have been heavily researched so that we get what it was like to be alive in 1995 or 1956 or 2004, that they're accurate. And don't worry about having a bad memory. You can research anything these days, but make sure you do good research and get it right. Mm. And little tip, you know, keep journaling. I, I've got journals since I was about 15. And, and those early ones are just shocking. You know, they should never see the light of day. But at least I can go back and go, wow, I, you know, I like you talk about God when I was 15 and had a conversion experience. I really loved God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my journals are just full of this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, Good. And yeah, and it's really interesting because you almost feel like you're you're visiting your old self and so since then I've really been careful I don't journal every day you know I don't do morning pages or any of that but I, I journal regularly enough that once when I decide to go back and pick things up then I will have a sort of letter from myself at that point. Great it's wonderful and there's so many ways to do research letters that your parents sent to one another or as I said yearbooks there's a whole realm but to understand why you're doing it is essential to get it right. And journals are great. Diaries are fantastic. Photo albums are rich as they can be. Sit down with your sister with the photo album. And there will be some agreement. You know, at least you'll agree on the name of the family dog. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'd be surprised. <laughs> Yeah. As soon as I said that, I thought, nah, no, yeah. I have a sister. My, I was telling a, a, part, a, a story at a dinner party recently and that my sister was at. And I told this story and I thought it was hilarious, of course. And at the end of the story, she looked up to a party of 11 people at a dinner and she said, that never happened. <laughs> Yeah, that happens to me all the time with my brother and all yeah. my mum, you know, to, and it is exactly as you say about the different memories of an occasion make people feel in, in a different way. And I think that is just another question I wanted to ask about emotional resonance, because I feel like one of the resistances, <laughs> the resistance I feel towards writing memoir is no one's going to care. Like, why would anyone care about this? And I mean, even taking an example you've said about your garden, uh, finding uh, peace in, in a garden, um, how do we make people care about that? I mean, you talked about the universal at the beginning, but how do we make sure that people care? So when I read a book that has somebody going hand over hand up an ice face mountain in Nepal, I don't do so because I'm going to do that. I do that to feed my sense of human wonder, endurance, resiliency. And I feel 100% sure that it does that exact thing, that it's challenging my sense of, of resiliency or endurance. And so how you get them to care is constantly keeping in mind that universal because we are not reading your book for what you did. We're reading your book for what you did with it. And that is the huge secret of memoir. We're not reading your story for what you did. We're reading your story for what you did with it. And if you can keep that in mind at all times, you will be successful. I'm just uh, wondering about that noise behind you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm closing a, there must be a construction guy outside. So I've just closed a window and let's hope, and let me know, did you turn off the? Uh, no, it's still, it's still running. I'll, let's just carry on. I, I, uh, I'm sure, you know, a little bit's fine. It's just if it was going to yeah. keep going. No, so I have I, no idea. I can't see it. And I can see, close Okay, it's not in your house, so it's all, it's all good. No, no. Okay. Somebody cool. outside. 
So th- those are some great examples. And I wonder, because you obviously, as you mentioned, you've had, you know, seen thousands of these books over the years. Are there any other common issues that you see in manuscripts as a coach? And, you know, what should we look out for? So common issues in memoir are several, one of which is dialogue. People, as you mentioned before, don't remember what they said. You want to remember that you're reconstructing dialogue. And of course, you weren't keeping a notebook unless you were a very strange little kid at eight (laughs) years old. You weren't keeping a notebook. But I do keep one now everywhere I am. I have one tied to the gear shift of my car. I have one in the bathroom. I have one next to the bed. I'm writing things down all the time. But you weren't when you were eight. So you're reconstructing that dialogue. What that means is you don't ever make yourself more clever, more intelligent, or wittier than you were in the moment. In fact, it's so human not to have a retort, right? Somebody dumps you on the street. Somebody literally breaks up with you on the street when you're 15 or 18 or whatever. You probably weren't very clever when they did that. You probably were silent and crushed right from the accurate intent, right? Remember, always go in with with that intent to be accurate. You probably didn't say anything. You probably grabbed something out of your purse. You probably went to the nearest pizza parlor and shoved an entire pie in your mouth. Show us the real. Don't make yourself out to be something you never were. We can smell that a mile away, and we can smell it in dialogue more than anything else. So dialogue reconstruction is very, very important. If your parents sat you down when you were 13 to tell you that they're getting divorced, you probably remember who was angry, who was crying, and who was quiet. And just reconstruct that. You remember the basics of the conversation because you know the personalities of those people involved. And also with with dialogue, people hang way too much off the ends of their quotes. They say things like, no, she said with a slight smirk on her face that indicated that she'd heard this kind of memoir, this kind of memory before, or she'd heard this kind of dialogue. No, no, just no. Floating on a page is all you need. So with memoir in particular, I find that people just attach so much to their quotes that we lose the power of language. And a good, well-placed no tells volumes of characterization of what was happening in the moment. So that's one of them. I think that's probably the most important lesson I can impart with people is keep the dialogue brisk and don't hang anything off of your quotes. Mm, that's a good one. And um, I actually did quite a lot of uh, screenwriting training and wrote a few screenplays, not that they went anywhere, but I, that helped me because, you know, the, the, the rule there is if you give a script to an actor, do not have things in parentheses like angrily, you know, you should be able to convey that in dialogue um, yes. and through action. And that's exactly the same as you say in memoir. It's it's not uh, explaining how people are meant to say things. So no, that that's fantastic. I never thought about that with with memoir. So I want to just uh, shift gears a little bit because uh, I want to ask about marketing. You know, this this podcast is very much for authors who do want to sell some books. Obviously, there is a great reason just to write memoir. It doesn't mean it has to sell any copies, and it's you know very worthy anyway but uh, in terms of marketing memoir specifically what have you seen in in the genre that that works so what i've seen is being a bit brave right what if i saw a book the other day that wasn't memoir but this made me just delighted it was a field guide to mushrooms right to fungi i think i've got and, that <laughs> and the author took her, I think it was a him, his copy, and made it, got it really wet, and left it in a dark and nasty place and grew mushrooms all over it, and then took a photograph of it. <laughs> I just love this person. It was so meta that I kind of had to put my head down on the table and say, oh, that's so funny. That's so, so, so funny. So I think it's a great example of what can you do? You know, what can you do that's that's different? And I think that in memoir, we think that people just want to hear our story when, in fact, again, they want to hear what the story tells us. What about mercy? What about the 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 relationship between dogs? So what in between dogs and humans? So to market your memoir well, what you want to remember is it lives really there in your subtitle. What is the the value proposition for the reader? 
what am I going to get when I read this? I am not reading it for your story. I am not. Please trust me. I'm not. I'm reading it for my own sense of wonder or mercy or forgiveness. So what can you market in that one little word? What have you got? Can you do a little video? Can you get me a, a an Instagram series that teaches me about mercy, about the many qualities of mercy and draw me in. I'm fascinated by the things I'm seeing on social media and how good people are getting at teaching me small lessons on mercy, let's say, in an Instagram stream that allows me to realize the value proposition of reading this entire book. So it's that, go into that, what I call the X factor and really dig into it, that word that's going to be in your subtitle that gives me that value proposition and find a way to make me think that you know something that I need to know. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's really the non-fiction topic that's yep. below the memoir. And, and it's, it is interesting because, of course, my, the memoir I'm thinking about is a travel memoir. And that's why I started my other podcast, which is Books and Travel. And I actually interviewing quite a lot of memoir writers because a lot of people write memoir about travel. So I kind of did that in order to start building up an audience for the memoir that I may write one day. <laughs> <laughs> which is quite funny but I did want Brilliant. to ask you about podcasting in particular because you have a podcast QWERTY mm -hmm. which uh, I have been on um, and so I but I wondered why did you personally start podcasting and how has it helped you in your business so I started podcasting because I wanted to have more conversations with writers I am still living a solitary lifestyle as, as I have been for many many years as a writer I work with writers all day long one-on-one -on -one, or in classes that I teach. But what I wasn't having was conversations with my peers. And that was really missing from the people who, who have just published and have new insights into how do you get it out there? How do you be the person you are on the page? That's a, that's a question I asked Richard Zacks, who is a historian of only of vice. He's a remarkable writer, a whole lot of best-selling books. But he's always, he was a kid who grew up in New York City going to peep shows, and literally, like those things that we weren't supposed to go to. He's very honest about it. The only thing that interests him is Vice. And he's written a remarkable series of books that include the history of Vice in America. Well, how do you, you know, people don't have any encouragement to do that. He grew up in a fairly traditional Jewish household in New York, not conservative, but but not lib, not crazy liberal. So I needed to talk to someone about how you give yourself permission to pursue what you really love to be a writer. So I needed to have a conversation with you about how do you ignore that terrible advice about you better specialize, young lady, or you're never going to get anywhere, <laughs> right? Because you sure as heck haven't specialized like that and stayed in one little pod. You've tried all kinds of things. And I want to talk to people who are publishing. So that's what got me to start a podcast, my own curiosity. How does it fold into my brand? It's about how to. It's really about giving other people, presumably young writers, tips on how to write from themselves, how to, not, how to ignore the bad advice, how to do research. So the topics each week take on something else that's a how-to. Mm, I think that's great because I feel like a lot of people think that they are going to podcast for marketing reasons. But as you say, it's, I mean, I've been doing this for a decade now, this show, and the last time you were on, it was like eight years ago. And, but we get something from the conversation that's not just about marketing, right? We get some right. kind of, we learn something new or we think something different after the conversation. Yes. And I think that you have to constantly go in with wonder. I'm endlessly curious about how to have a writing life. And there's just no end of combination to it. I have a friend who's 92, who's, I think, the world, the, the greatest living American writer, William Kennedy. He's an astonishing writer. He's 92 years old. He's currently writing a novel and a play. He's also caregiving his elderly wife. And he's got kids and a house and stuff. That's a whole other conversation is aging with your own ideas, right? He's fascinating on the subject of endurance. I have a friend named Russell Banks, who's one of America's great novelists. He writes 
365 days a year. I have seen him leave the dinner table when he's done and go back to work. His discipline is astonishing. He also only writes one page a day, but it's 365 pages a year. Mm. And he publishes some of the greatest reviewed novels there are. So what do you learn from each of these? something that you didn't know and going in with that kind of intent you're going to have fun too and it's got it shows yours show you're having fun you're learning I'm learning I never want to stop learning Mm. no me too and I think that's why I'm still doing this show and why you you know you continue with with QWERTY but you mentioned endurance there and I want to circle back to what you said at the beginning uh when we asked about your background so 1983 when you left uh, the New York Times. So running your own business and being a, a full-time creative since then, and you, you mentioned building a business around a book. So I want to ask mm-hmm. you about longevity and endurance and all those people listening who want to make a living with their writing. What does a business around a book look like? And a, what does a business around a writing life look like for you? So when I had... I- Previously published three books through three of the biggest publishers in the world, Houghton Mifflin, Bloomsbury, and 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 Grant and Grand Central published the the Memoir Project, the most recent one, and Simon and Schuster published another book. So before I had gotten to Grand Central, I had published with big publishers. I'd had the traditional experience, the 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 advance, the book tour, lots and lots of experiences, and I learned a lot. But what I also learned is, hmm. What if you did it the other way? What if you threw something down for the public and you said, now I'm going to build something out of that? In other words, the book isn't it's only it, the only product. It's not the, it's not the only widget here on the table. And I knew if I challenged myself to write a book on how to write memoir and then backed it up with an online business, I'd have myself an adventure. And so that's the word, adventure. This might as well be an adventure. I say to writers every day, you better love the work. Because if you really are just thinking about making millions from your publication, you are going to be disappointed. (laughs) It's not just that you're not going to make the millions. It's that you're going to be disappointed because you're not going to love the process. And it's the adventure of this. What have you got? When I write, I feel like everything I've ever seen, tasted, thought, smelled, considered every movie I've ever seen is being annotated and drawn up from this wonderful place. And that's thrilling. But every once in a while, right, you want to heighten that adventure just a little bit more. And that's what got me to start this business from the book was a greater sense of adventure. What else can I do? I've seen the publishing model. I've done it. It's great. Okay. I've published with some of the most most amazing places in the world. What's new? What's different? What's hard? I happen to love to work without a net. I'm very much, when I left the New York Times, everybody tried to talk me out of it. And I understood their concern for me. I was 27 years old. My parents had both just, well, my mother was an Alzheimer's patient. My father had just died. There was no guarantee of an income. But to me, it seemed like the greatest adventure in the world. So that's a long answer to adventure, curiosity, and the endurance piece is keeping it new, right? Mm -hmm. The what are you interested in? My four books are four different topics. They're all nonfiction. So keeping it new is what really, really interests me. And that's because you know better than anyone, when you write a book, you're going to have to spend some real time with it. You better love the topic. And again, to get back to my first answer, you better love the work. Oh, yeah. I I just think no one is going to last very long uh, doing this without loving the work. And Mm -hmm. like you mentioned, uh, discipline, and you asked me about discipline as well in our interview with me on your show. And I think I also said then, I never feel like I have discipline because I love (laughs) I love what I do. You know, it Mm -hmm. doesn't take discipline for me to get online with you and have this conversation because this is great. You know, I'm really happy to do this anyway. And it's just a bonus that it's also marketing and income and everything else. But yeah, as you say, loving the work and and also curiosity for change, because goodness, things have changed in the publishing business since 1983. (laughs) Yes, wildly. Mm. And and you might as well accept that. And the thing that I think separates a lot of people, strange as it sounds, is the technology. They're afraid of it. So don't be afraid of it. Find out how to do it. It's not that hard to master one or two pieces of social media 
and put yourself up maybe just a landing page. So if you publish an op-ed, an essay somewhere, and I think, well, she's smart. I like her. I can find you. And then I can find that you've got a book that you're working on. And maybe I'll become a fan. Or better yet, a publisher or an agent can find that you've got a book that you're working on. And maybe they can contact you. It's just remembering that you do have to be found. You have to be able to be found these days. It is just part of the process. It was not when I started in 1983. It had nothing to do, you know, unless somebody looked you up in the phone book. It wasn't (laughs) about being found. Now, more than ever, it's about being found and then compounding that name in a very positive way online so that we want more. Which is a great time to ask you, where can people find you and your books and classes and everything (laughs) you do online? That's lovely. At marionroach.com, M-A-R-I-O-N-R-O-A-C-H.com. There's lots of classes. There's lots of access to the books and essays and everything else. It's a big online site that now includes even a, a shopping cart and I'm a, and lots of recorded classes. I started my brand as a live brand only and the demand has been such that people really want to take the classes with them on their phones. Okay, so so I just decided to record all the classes and put them up as well. Mm, that's brilliant. And of course, the QWERTY podcast, which you can find in your podcast app. So thanks so much, Marion. That was fantastic. Thank you, Joanna. And write well. So I hope you found the interview with Marion interesting. I really love her attitude around curiosity and adventure and continuous learning. It's certainly what keeps me coming back to writing. And of course, write what you're interested in, not what you know. I I feel like write what you know only lasts a book or two and then you have to write what you're interested in. (laughs) I also think the model of the business around a book is really important for creatives to consider. And you better love the work if you want to do this long term. So um yeah oh I also wanted to say I liked Marion's bit about uh now more than ever it's about being found and then compounding that name in a positive way online so that people want more and I I think this is a great way to look at marketing over the long term and Marion's been in this business a lot longer than most of us uh which is it's not about tactics. Tactics are short term. It is about long term compounding effect from all the different things we do as authors. Okay, next week, I'm talking to Philip Athens about how to write monsters, uh, which is a totally fun interview. And Phil and I just geek out and generally have a laugh when it comes to writing monsters and not taking ourselves too seriously. I love a good monster book. And, um, you know, from sort of Jurassic Park with dinosaurs. And I actually just read Max Brooks' latest uh, Devolution, which is a a Bigfoot thriller. (laughs) You've got to love a monster. So join us for some light relief next week and uh, writing tips on monsters. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.